I want to start this morning with one passage, one verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17. Elder Franco ministered to us last Sunday concerning the lost art of stillness. Being able to simply just be still before God and wait. Too many people are throwing words up towards God. What we need is God to throw words to us. We need God to speak, to give guidance, to give direction, to change us. Amen? Past two Wednesday nights I've been teaching on... Um, meditation and how it relates to prayer as another form of prayer and um, I pray that's been a blessing I know it's been a blessing to me but to be able to share with you some of those thoughts that God has been dealing with me about and uh, I want to continue somewhat in that vein this morning this past Wednesday night as I was teaching we started talking a little bit about in the presence of God there is a new identity for his people Tell your neighbor, the perfect you is in God. Right? That's, a deep, that's just a few words, but it's such a deep statement. And there's a lot to that. And, and I'm going to try to address some of it this morning so that we can leave with a practical knowledge how that we can practically access that new me. I feel like a lot of people sometimes, a lot, most people, I guess, come to church and we throw around a lot of religious lingo, like terms like in Christ in God but to somebody who doesn't really understand the fullness of that I don't know how beneficial such words are because we at some point we've got to be able to apply practically what we hear in church right it's not good to just throw around verses and then not have the the, the deeper understandings of those verses because deeper is not necessarily mystic deeper is actually practical Right? How many times have you ever come across a verse and you're like, but how do I live that? Right? It's great. I believe it. It's in the word of God. It's faithful. It's true. It's a witness unto me. But I've got questions about how do I apply that specific verse to my practical everyday life. Right? That's the missing link in modern Christianity. We, we sing songs, words on the screen, words. I don't, most people don't sing out of songbooks anymore, but I guess some people still do. Words on a page. We read scriptures on the screen, scriptures on our, in our Bibles, on our phones. But there's a missing link between what's being written and what's being practiced. That's why there's so much hypocrisy in Christianity. So many people claiming Christ, but yet many people haven't departed from iniquity. Right? That's what the apostle told us. Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Everybody's running around talking about, I love me some Jesus, but not many people obeying his commandments. True love is in obedience, right? If we truly love him, we're going to obey. And I, I fear there's such a, and I think it's evident because when you invite people to church, they're like, nah, I ain't got no time for church. Too many hypocrites, right? And that's, it, sadly, it's true. Ain't no need to argue with somebody. That's the truth. And in the majority of churches that you go into, a lot of the people there, if not the majority, are living some sort of hypocritical life, right? And that we, we're actually shooting ourselves in the foot, so to speak, when it comes to evangelism because of this hypocrisy. So how do we fix the hypocrisy? What's the cure for the hypocrisy? We've got to be more than just hearers or readers of the word. We've got to be doers. Well, practically, how do you do the word? That's what we've been talking about, these deeper revelations and manifestations that we've been teaching on uh, the past couple of weeks, specifically on Wednesday night when I went pretty deep in um, the purpose of that is not to get a mystical understanding. The purpose of that is to get a practical understanding that you can practice so that we can do these things, not just speak about these things, but so that we can actually do these things, right? So when we're talking about being in Christ, in God, 
I, I don't have time to teach the series for those of you who weren't here. But if you, you want to hear it, get with me. Give me your email address. I can send you a link and you can watch those videos on YouTube. But some of this stuff, um, uh, I'll kind of be tr trying to tie it, to tie it together as best I can. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Notice what the Apostle Paul writes to the saints at Corinth. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a... The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. That's such a powerful statement. How many people, as, and I'm talking about Christians now, people who have been claimed Christ, believed in Christ, been baptized, filled with His Spirit, um, and have been coming to church maybe for some time. How many of us sit down and we think, I, I wish I was different? Right? Has that thought ever crossed your mind? Like, I've been living for God for some time now. But there's still quite a few things about myself that I want to be different. Right? And that missing link is many people are coming in contact with Christ. They're getting introduced to Christ, but they don't understand the fullness of what it means to be in Christ. That tabernacle plan is the perfect example. What we talked about on Wednesday nights, I went through that pretty much in detail. To be in Christ is to put on Christ. It's not just an, the word Christian is in the New Testament three times. Only three times in the entirety of the New Testament is the word Christian mentioned. We talked about this a couple of years ago. But the words, the phrase in Christ is in the scripture 68 times. Modern Christianity, we refer to ourselves as Christians just to, like, like we add Christ to our lives. Like there's my life and then I add Christ to my life and that's what it means to be a Christian. But the first church really didn't even use that term concerning themselves. When they referred to their relationship with Christ, they said, I am in Christ. Super deep meaning. Right? Like I can carry, I use this illustration when I taught on this a, a year or so ago about being, what does it really mean to be in Christ? You take a water bottle, you can stick it in your pocket, and, and is the water bottle in you? Or is it with you? With you. But if I dive off in the deep end of the pool, is the pool with me? Or am I in it? Most people's Christianity is just sticking Christ in the Sunday morning pocket. Right? That's their concept. That's their understanding of Christianity. Christ is something that I add to my life. I just take him around with me. And when it's convenient, I flip out my Jesus badge. Here I am. I'm, 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 a, I'm a Christian. Right? But the New Testament concept was anything but that. It was a completely different identity from the person you were before. You, you, you didn't bring Christ along with you. You literally got engulfed. In Christ, submerged in Christ. Even the practice of baptism is the perfect man physical manifestation of that. Nobody in the scriptures sprinkled. They dipped them completely into Christ. A physical act that represented a spiritual occurrence. I am literally burying myself, engulfing myself, saturating myself. I am, my, I am disappearing. Jeff Brantley is disappearing into Christ. And if we are buried with him in baptism, then we are also raised with him into a newness of a new identity. Therefore, if anyone is not a Christian, because Christians, people, people just throwing the term around, Christians don't have to be new creatures. We see it all the time, right? I'm a Christian now, but you act in the same way and speak in the same way and doing the same things. What? What's new? You're doing the same old stuff. But if anyone is truly in Christ, submerged, 
covered in Christ. He is a new creature. All the old things passed away. And now there's new things, right? And then not only is this when you come to Christ and you get saved, that the, the in Christ, the, the, the tabernacle plan, and I'm so tempted to go through the whole thing and just teach it all in like six hours again. Make sure everybody gets it because I don't want us to miss these points. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the tabernacle is, the pattern initially can be your initial conversion to Christ, right? When we come through the tabernacle plan, the altar is, it represents repentance before God. The brazen laver represents baptism, water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, where we literally put on Christ. And then we enter into the holy place and we start learning about how to interact with Christ. We are literally in Christ in the holy place. Christ represents that seven golden candlesticks, the table of showbread. Christ is the bread of heaven, the altar of incense. Christ is the high priest before God that offers up incense, after, a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And now Christ has made us to become a kingdom of priests to his God and his father. Right? So we see in that holy place, everything is about Christ. So when you pray through, meditate through the tabernacle plan, you literally are putting on Christ anew. You do it when you come to him the first time in repentance and baptism. But we then go back and do it again consistently over and over to make sure that we are still in Christ. Because anytime I get in my carnal mind, I can step right out of Christ and step right back into the old Jeff Brantley. Right? So I've got to fight to remain in Christ. And praying and meditating through God's tabernacle plan is how we stay. We stay in Christ. And when you are in Christ, there's a new identity there. Somebody say new identity. New identity. New person. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. I want to revisit two scriptures that we addressed Wednesday night. I'm going to hit them very quickly. And I'm going to move on to something else a little bit deeper. Romans 12 and 1, Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brethren, I urge you by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Now the imagery he's using is from the Old Testament tabernacle plan. The image of a priest presenting a sacrifice to God, a physical animal sacrifice to God on that altar in the outer court of the tabernacle. That's what he's referring to. But now in the New Testament, we all have become priests. And our responsibility as a Christian is to be a priest. People, Christian is not coming to church on Sunday morning. To, to truly be, the word Christian simply means like Christ. To be like Christ means I take up my cross, deny myself daily, and follow Christ. Well, where is Christ? As of right now, the scriptures tell us he's at the throne of God, interceding, offering the sacrifice of his own life even unto God. Hebrews 9 tells us that, that Christ offered himself unto God as a sacrifice. And he's even right there now making intercession. That altar of incense is going up before him. Now, we are supposed to take up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow Christ. Where is Christ? Offering sacrifice. So where am I supposed to be? Offering sacrifice. To be like Christ means I do what Christ is doing. Christ is a high priest offering a sacrifice. He's called me to be a priest also offering a sacrifice. Now what's the sacrifice? People think that being a Christian is about coming to church and worshiping and maybe say a prayer a couple of times throughout the week and that's, that's what it means to be a Christian. Not even close. To be a Christian, truly to be a Christian, to be in, more specifically, to be in Christ, means you present, you are the sacrifice. Not only are you the priest, you are the sacrifice. And we're talking about in any physical sense, you're not, it's craziness of, of suicide. It, no, but the way I live my life, the way I speak, the way I think, the way I act towards others, the choices that I make, 
in that way, I'm presenting myself, my body, as a living sacrifice. Not a dead sacrifice. A living sacrifice, holy, uh, which is acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Everybody thinks, we talked in depth about this Wednesday night, everybody thinks worship is physical on Sunday morning. That, that's an element. What we do is certainly worship. I'm not downplaying what we do on Sunday mornings. It's important. But the greatest form of worship that a person will ever offer to God is not a few words on a Sunday morning. The greatest form of worship is when you present everything that you are to him every day of your life. We don't just worship him with our words. He wants us to worship him with our lives. And so many people come to, come to church and they have a physical, uh, physical experience on Sunday morning. And we can sing songs. We can go through the motions of church and never do even offer our minds to God as a sacrifice. We can offer our bodies without offering our minds. What good is it? Does God want an empty sacrifice? God's not after your body. Your body's going to rot in the dust of the earth, turn to ash. God's not trying to save your body. He's trying to save your soul, your mind. He's got a new body prepared for the soul, right? And we've got churches all over America this morning that people are presenting their bodies to God. At least they're showing up in church. That's good. That's a step in the right direction. But what I'm saying is don't sell yourself short. So many people are getting introduced to God through physical worship, but they never understand mental worship. Because I can sing songs in here that I've sung a thousand times before and never do even have to think about God. Y'all looking at me like I'm lost my mind, right? Am I the only one that has gone through in the past and sang a song and caught myself about 10 minutes into worship thinking, you ain't even thought about me yet. God, convicting me. You ain't even, your mind is not even on me. You're still thinking about laundry and cutting grass. And, and you've been here physically for 10 minutes. You've presented a physical sacrifice, but you haven't given me all of yourself. You haven't given me the part that I'm really after to begin with. Not just your body. I want your mind. And so people can come and go, and they graze up against the presence of God with a physical offering, a physical praise, a physical worship, but they never truly surrender their minds to God. So the person who leaves and never really offered their mind to God as a living sacrifice leaves the same exact person they were when they came in. Still bound in sin, still eat up with lust, still eat up with pride and bitterness and unforgiveness. And all the things that we, we hate them, but we can't seem to escape these things. Why can't we escape them? Why does it have such a hole? Because your mind is given to that. But it's not been given to God. And the only way to get your mind out of the possession of all those things that we hate so much is to offer my mind as a living sacrifice to God. Because when I offer my mind as a living sacrifice to God, then God cuts off the hole that bitterness and unforgiveness has had on my mind. And then there's real transformation. There's real change. Watch this. Present your bodies to God, a living sacrifice Holy and acceptable, this is your spiritual service of worship, right? Notice verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. It's what we're talking about. We've been so bound by this world, its thoughts, its feelings, its attitudes, its bitterness, its unforgiveness. We've been conformed to that our, because our mind has so been dedicated to that. We think about it all the time. It's all we think about. Right? But he says, do not be conformed to this world. Now we're getting to the deeper meaning of what it means to present yourself as a sacrifice to God. Don't be conformed to this world, but be 
transformed. How then am I going to transform my life from being caught up in all that foolishness to caught up into all that God is, his holiness, his righteousness, his freedom, his liberty? How do I make that transformation? Your mind has to be renewed. Just physically worshiping God doesn't cause transformation. And we all know it. Because any of us who have been to church at all in a worship experience and then we left and then we went right back into the, the same old person that we were. Still bound by all that we were before we physically interacted with God. So we know in our hearts it's possible to offer a physical sacrifice to God without ever giving him the mind. But you will never be transformed. Never, you will never be transformed until you offer God your. That's the place the transformation takes. Takes root. Super deep, right? Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed. And there's only one way it happens. Physical worship will get you to the place where transformation can happen. But if you just limit yourself to physical worship, you step right back out of that place and you run right back into the person that you were. Physical worship is given, God gives us the ability to lift our hands and use our voices and use our lips because it's a way to get our mind in the right place. That's what God intended, that our mind is in the right place. And then once my mind is in the right place, that's when transformation takes place. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove. So that you got to be transformed so that you may prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. So many people struggling with what God will, will in my life. The reason they don't understand. The reason... And, and Paul talks about this in, in Romans uh, 6, 7, and 8. He said, I, I want to do what's right by God, but I can't. I find another law in my members. Right? So he's saying my physical body wants to get access to God, but just through physical praise and worship, I can't get there. My mind has to be, a deeper part of me has to be given to God than just my, my hands, just my lips. My mind has got to be totally sold out to God. And when my mind is sold out, I don't have to be conformed to the world, but I can be transformed because God will renew my mind when I offer it to him. It'll be renewed. I'll think differently. And when I have a renewed mind, then I can, then I can live out the will of God for my life. What is God's will for your life? We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, to be holy. Right? Why can't we be holy? We want to be holy, but we struggle to be holy. Why? Because we're giving our physical bodies to God once a month. And we're not presenting our minds to God on a daily basis where Christ is presenting that offering, that sacrifice to God. And so there's no transformation. There's no change. Makes sense? There's a better way. There's a better way than that cycle of foolishness that we give ourselves to. There's a better way. This is it. Don't be conformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Prove what the will of God is. Verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say, everyone among you not to think. That's what God's trying to get to. That's what God's trying to change. If he can change how you think, he can change everything else about your life. But if he never changes how you think, he'll, he can never change anything else. That's why we struggle with the same actions over and over and over again. Why? Because we think the same way over and over and over again. As a man thinketh in his heart, so shall he be. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And I'll add one to it, the hands doeth. Whatever's in the heart is what you're going to do. Whatever's in the mind is what you're going to do. So if I want to stop what I'm doing and do the right thing, i got to stop what I'm thinking and think the right thing. And if I'm thinking the right thing, I can then easily do the right thing. And people are trying to do the right thing without truly having a transformation of mind. 
and the transformation of mind only takes place in the, in the presence of God through prayer and meditation. Only. That's the only place it's going to happen. On a consistent, practical basis. For through the grace given to me, I say, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. I want to teach you how to think, God says, when you present your mind to me. I'm going to teach you how to think. But to think so as to have sound judgment. Right? To think right. And God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So, in, this, in these three passages, what is Paul telling us? You, as a pre you have been called to be a priest unto God. Your calling as a priest is to offer a sacrifice. What is the sacrifice? Your mind. What will happen if you offer God your mind? He will transform you. There is literally a new identity waiting in the presence of God. A new you is waiting in the presence of God. A transformed, empowered, mature, free from the bondages of sin. That you is waiting in the presence of God. Literally, a new identity. The scriptures are full of it. We're going to hit some of it this morning. But the only way, this is the key, the only way you're going to get to that place is learning to be still before God, offering him not only your physical body through praise and worship. Do that, yes. But make sure that your mind is also a part of the sacrifice of the fruit of your lips. Because the mind is ultimately what he's trying to get to. And if he can transform your mind, he can transform... The, Everything about your life. He can bring you out of depression. He can bring you out of bitterness and anger and wrath. He can cut those ties that bind and set you free from all of that. But not through just a half-hearted physical relationship with God. you got to give him your mind. And he can set us free. That's so powerful to me. I thank God for this. Give me Ephesians 4 and 21. If indeed you have heard him, talking about Jesus, and have been taught in him, taught. See, notice the language they used. He didn't say taught of him. They're talking about this deeper level, this deeper understanding. You are taught in him. Not just of him. You're taught in him. Just as truth is in Jesus. Jesus said it this way. I am the truth. It's not just words coming out of my lips. I am the truth. You're going to have to get to know me to get to know truth. It's an invitation to relationship. I'm not going to tell you the truth. I am the truth. If you want truth, come to me. Get to know me. It's a revelation through relationship, not an impartation of knowledge. We Gentiles, we, we're so wrapped up in school and university and, and college and, and all these things. And we, we, what we're looking for is to gain knowledge, gain knowledge, gain knowledge. Christ is completely opposite from that. He's not just freely handing out knowledge. What good is knowledge that you're not even using? What good is knowledge that you're not practicing? How many times did Jesus say, go and do likewise? Right? So he's not trying to just give an impartation of knowledge because we that's the mentality most people come to church with is they come and they sit on the pew and, all right, teach me something I've never heard before. And we bring that same carnal-minded mentality into the house of God. But God doesn't work the same way that your local college or university works. You have to get to know God. Like I can go in, sit in a class with a teacher in a college or a university or a class or a seminar or any subject in the world. I don't have to know anything about that guy that's teaching or that woman that's teaching. And I can gain knowledge. 
But what God is saying is, I want you to come, get to know me. Christ, come, get to know me. Know my ways. Study me. And once you know me, then I'll release the knowledge you're looking for. It's called revelation. And revelation comes through relationship. Not a classroom. I can sit up here and teach. Not me, I'll use somebody else. Elder Waldron can get up here and teach powerful revelations from God. And it go right over everybody's head in the congregation. Revelations that have changed his life. That God has shown him through prayer and him seeking God. And he tries to share that with people and it goes right over everybody's head. And they don't even get it. Why? Because what he got through relationship, you're not going to be able to retain except through your own relationship. Ah. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus, 22, that in reference to your former manner of life, here's the new identity again. In reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. You still got lust in your heart because your heart hasn't been transformed. Why hasn't your heart been transformed? Because your heart slash your mind, same thing, I'm using the terms interchangeably. Your heart slash your mind hasn't been renewed. Why hasn't it been renewed? Because it hasn't been fully presented to God. <laughs> so if I fully present my mind to God and say, God, here is my mind, teach me how to think. He renews my mind, which in turn causes transformation. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. This is why most people miss out on this, this principle. They don't understand. They think coming to church is presenting my mind to God. You can come to church 50 years and never do present your mind to God. That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is, being, is corrupted in accordance with the lust that is in your heart, the lust that is in your mind. That's why you can't escape Escape it. <clears throat> Verse 23. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your... What's God after? If he's got... A, if, he, if you have offered your mind to him, he doesn't have to worry about what your body's going to do. Or your body's going to say. Right? <laughs> the reason he, God has to worry about a lot of us, what we're going to do and what we're going to say, is because he knows he doesn't have control of our mind. He's not had the opportunity to renew our minds yet. Teach us a higher level of thinking. But to the person who constantly and consistently is offering their mind to God, God doesn't have to worry about you sinning. Deep stuff. 24. And put on, once you've learned to, to put your mind and be renewed in the spirit of your mind through prayer, through meditation, and put on the new self, which is in the, he's literally teaching you to be just like him. He's teaching you to think like him, to feel like him, to speak like him. And you put on the new self, which, is, which in the likeness of God has been created. So in God, there is a new self. When you approach God and you're praying through this tabernacle plan and you're getting into his presence, you come in and in the presence of God there is a new you. And every time you interact with him, he's taking a piece out of the old you and he's taking a piece out of the new you and plugging it in. Like Legos. You say, well that, that sounds super deep, that sounds super mystical. Listen, how many, you, God's been doing this with you already and you didn't even realize he was doing it. 
How many times have you been sitting around and like you, you might be thinking or meditating or reading a scripture or being a church service, and then all of a sudden this thought comes, you know how you handled that situation yesterday? You should have handled it differently. You could have handled it a better way. You could have said it a different way. What is God doing? He's, t- he's taking out a bad Lego, the old Legos, and he's putting in the new Lego, plugging and playing wisdom, plugging and playing righteousness, plugging and playing holiness. And every time I come to him, I get a little bit more of that new self applied. That's what he's teaching us. That's the exact principle. I'm putting it in modern terms, but that's the exact principle that Paul's teaching us here. Renew. Get in the presence of God. Get your mind renewed. Put on the new identity, which is in God. Put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness. That new you is righteous. The old you is not. But the new you is righteous. The new you is holy. The new you knows truth. Live, not only knows it, lives truth. Because God doesn't reveal truth outside of relationship. you got to get to know him through prayer. And then God can reveal truth. Ah. Powerful. Go back two chapters with me. Go to um, Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, we'll start with 4 for the sake of time. So there is a new you in when you present, only when you present your mind to God through prayer, through meditation, consistently, faithfully, perpetually, over and over and over again. When you seek him for that level of relationship, in his presence there is a new you. And he is slowly transforming you into that new creature. Watch this. Paul writes here, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love, Wherewith he, he loved us. When we're approaching God, we're approaching a loving Father. Five, even when we were dead in transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Christ. Just like he raised Christ up, we now are called to take up our own cross, Deny ourselves and follow Christ. Wherever he goes, whatever he's doing. So in that Christ has been walked in a new life. The first person to ever live a sinless life. And now we've been called to do the same. God has raised us up with Christ. And now watch this. And seated us with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, when you read that phrase, think tabernacle plan. Remember we talked about putting, and you're in the outer court, then when you get ready to go into that, that most holy place, the second phase of the tabernacle, you are literally putting on Christ. You're engulfing yourself in Christ. And when we put ourselves in Christ, when our mind has been put in that mental place of being in Christ, then we we are literally seated in heavenly places because we are in Christ. And where is Christ? At the right hand of God, in heavenly places. But the only way I'm getting there is if I am in Christ. How do I get in Christ? By offering my mind to God, he teaches me to think just like Jesus. And once my mind has been transformed, then I'm given access to God just like Jesus had. Right? And that's In essence, that's exactly what Jesus is saying when he said, No man can come unto the Father except through me. If he tries to go in another way, he's a thief or a robber. What Jesus is saying is, in other words, if you're going to get to God, you've got to come through me. And not only through him, you've got to get in him. And then when you are in Christ, he can then take you into the presence of God.
Why do so many Christians struggle getting into the presence of God? They're not in Christ. They're not living according to his teachings. They're not obeying his commandments. So when they pray, they don't even get access to God. Because their unrighteousness, their unholiness keeps them out of intimate relationship with God. So when I say in Christ, that, that's super deep. It means you have put on Christ to where when God looks at your life, he doesn't even really see you anymore. He sees. That's the goal. Is to be conformed to the image of his dear son. And the only way I'm going to be conformed to the image of his dear son is i got to offer my mind as a sacrifice. Let him renew and transform my mind. He'll teach me to be just like Jesus. And raised us up with him. He seated us with Christ or with God in the heavenly places in Christ. So we get access to God through Christ in heavenly places. That don't do for y'all what it does for me. That's... That's tremendous to me. So that in the ages to come, so that there's a purpose behind this. So that in the ages to come, he might show us the surpassing riches. Remember I told you Wednesday night when you enter into the presence of God, God's standing there with gifts, treasures, mysteries, knowledge, wisdom, revelation, understanding, joy, peace, righteousness, healing. All these things are in the presence of God. He's standing there with gifts in his hand. Come here, son. Let me give you something. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us. But notice how he keeps tagging this on. Toward us in Christ Jesus. Hey, let me move on. I won't ever finish. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Verse 9. Not as a result of works, your own works, so that no one can boast. No flesh is going to glory in his presence. We talked about that as well, how that dynamic works. Verse 10. For we are, we who are in Christ, we are his, God's workmanship, created, the, the new us has been created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, if God wants you going about doing good things, what, what's he got to have control of first? Your mind. People are going about trying to do good works without having a renewed mind. So you got preachers who are pastoring churches who are sleeping with the secretary. Doing good works, but without a renewed mind. Hypocrisy. Good works are useless if your mind has not been renewed. Jesus said it as plainly as you can say it. He said, in that day, many shall come to me and they shall say, did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not heal the sick? And I'll say to them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. But we did good works in your name. But your mind was never changed. Your mind was never transformed. You did all of that physical works and never presented your mind to me to be transformed. It's everywhere. It's everywhere in the scriptures. But we are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. But you're only going to walk in what your mind tells you to walk in. If I'm going to do good works, I've got to have a good mind. And the only way to have my mind 
is to be tra- only have a good mind is to be transformed in the presence of God daily, consistently, through prayer and through meditation. It doesn't, I'm going to say this again. Transformation doesn't happen in praise and worship. We can come in here and shout and talk in tongues and run the aisles and then step right out here and be the same exact person, the same old nasty skank person that we were before we walked in. Do we not see it all the time? Usually the people shouting and dancing the most are the ones with the most sin in their life. Trying to make up for an unholy life Monday through Saturday by shouting louder than everybody else on Sunday. Trying to present good works without a transformed mind. You're not, you're not, that's the thing. We're not fooling anybody. We're not fooling the people that matter. We're not fooling God. We're not fooling Christ. That's all that matters in the end. Doesn't matter if we do fool this whole, this whole room of people. What's that going to matter on Judgment Day? Because I guarantee you, I am not going to be worried about what Leroy Waldron thinks of me on Judgment Day. There's only one opinion I'm going to be worried about. <laughs> that's the only one that will matter. And he knows the thoughts and intents of my heart. Leroy knows my actions. He knows the thoughts and intents of my heart. My mind. He knows the state of my mind. Somebody say a new mind. A new mind. Colossians 1. And I think I'm going to stop. I'm sorry. Colossians 3 verse 1. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ. Notice what he doesn't say. Therefore, if you are a Christian. It's way more personal than that. It's way deeper than that. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, if you are walking in a new life, like Christ walked in a new life, keep seeking. Keep seeking. Don't just do it one time to get saved. Keep seeking. That's the key because the new you isn't automatically given. Listen, how many of you when, you, when you had your conversion filled with the Spirit and, 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 you, and there was some change, there's some significant change, sure, there's significant change that takes place when we have that interaction, that saving interaction with God. But I'm still not everything I need to become when I get saved. There's yet a process of being saved Further, it's called being perfected. There's a difference between being saved and being perfected. And the goal of Christ is to perfect us. The goal of God is to perfect us. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things. Where? Not what's going on in this world. Not with your mind devoted all the time to the foolishness of this world. All the emotions and and problems of this world but give your mind keep seeking by give your mind by seeking the things which are above the things which are in prayer the things which are in meditation what God's going to show you about yourself when you truly get into his presence that's where the new you is going to be applied and then practiced in the real world keep seeking the things above where Christ is and we're Christians we're supposed to be following Christ so if we're going to follow Christ we're going to have to get where Christ is seated at the right hand of God verse 2 set your why is it that when you go to church you never hear anybody teaching these days about the mind they teaching about money they teaching about praise and worship they're teaching about music. But nobody's trying to teach. you got to get your mind right. All of this other stuff is useless without your mind being transformed. The scriptures talk much about the mind, but the modern church, and I use the term very loosely, the modern church doesn't speak much about the mind at all. If they do, it's from a self-help pop psychology type of 
thinking, just applying more carnal mindedness instead of actually transforming the mind from the carnal mind to the spiritual mind. Uh, set your mind on the things above. Says it again. Not on the things that are on the earth. Verse 3. For you have the old you The old you is supposed to have been dead. And your life now, your new life, is hidden. It's so hidden you probably won't even find it in this building. Like people come to the church like, I'm going to find my new life. No, you're not going to find it here. You're going to hear about it here. We're going to try to take the blinders off and, and turn you around and point you in the right direction. But you're not going to find a new you until you, for yourself, by yourself, get into the presence of God. Then God, just between you and Him, nobody else is involved, just between you and Him, He reveals, this is what I've been hiding from everybody else. This is the new you. I've been hiding it here for you. I've been waiting on you to come and visit me. Now that you have got your mind in the right place, let me show you who you are to become. I feel, the, I feel God in that. He has issued forth that invitation to each and every one of us. This is not for a select few of super spiritual people. This is for whosoever will, whosoever will. When Christ died on the cross, the veil in the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. Meaning not only the high, before that, only the high priest could go in. But when the veil in the temple was, was rent in twain, any man could enter in. He had to come through Christ and in Christ. But anybody who would get in Christ now has access to what God has hidden for him in his own presence. In heavenly places. In that right mental state. For you have died. Your old life is, is gone. But your new life is hidden. It's hidden with Christ. In God. Verse 4. When Christ. Who. Everybody's talking about, well, it's my life. I want to live it your way. It's not your life. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. When you're still talking about, well, it's my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. You're not, you, your mind hasn't been transformed. That's the old you. When you start making statements like the life that God has given me, then we know your mind has been transformed. You're not thinking like the old person anymore. You're thinking from God's perspective, from that higher, above perspective. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So not only does this have present benefits, it has future benefits. Five. Therefore, consider, therefore, tying what he's getting ready to say with what he just said. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as, now what, do what with them? Consider. Consider is, where is considering done? <laughs> We're trying to get the body to do things that it doesn't want to do and we're trying to keep it from doing things that it wants to do because we don't understand the mental aspect of all of this. Our mind hasn't been transformed because the mind has the power to control the body. The, let me put it this way. The spiritual mind has the power to control the body. The carnal mind is the servant to the body. 
So whatever your body wants to do, whatever lust is in your heart, that's what you're going to act out. Because the natural mind, the carnal mind, is a slave to the body. But when your mind has been transformed, you're no longer a slave to your own body. You've been given the mind of God, and the mind of God is not subject to the flesh. The mind of God actually has power over the flesh. A transformed mind. Therefore, consider, mental term, intellectual term, the, the, the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. Now, I can na- na- and there's no need to name all of this because there's somebody in this room wrestling with every single one of them. Most of us, multiples. But the issue is not When you ask most people the question, is it possible to stop looking at pornography? People who are carnal minded, if they're being honest, will say, no, I don't, I don't see how I could ever stop looking at pornography. Right? And that's the truth. The old you who is carnal minded will never be able to overcome Your mind is a slave to your lust, the lust of your flesh. And you are literally a slave to it and cannot overcome it with the carnal mind. The key then is that your mind must be transformed, must be renewed, so that your life can be transformed. And the spiritual mind is not subject to the lust of the flesh. So when you ask a spiritually minded person, is it possible for a person to stop looking at pornography? Yes. It absolutely is. Is it possible for you to live today, the rest of this day, without sinning against God? Yes. Carnal-minded person will say, I'm not real sure. Because they don't have the ability to consider their bodies dead. But the spiritual-minded person, that's all he thinks. I know it's possible because I've done it in the past. That's what he's thinking. If I could live yesterday and be holy and not sin before God, I can live today holy and not sin before God. And if I can live two days, I can live three. And if I can live three days, I can live four. And if I can live four days, I can live five. And we so become even more growth in the spiritual mind to where we look back and we're like, man, it's been months and I haven't sinned. Because and only because your mind was transformed. And you're no longer a slave to the lust of the flesh. Therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to all these things. Verse 6. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked. Yes, we did. When we were living... Because we were so engulfed in the flesh, the emotions, the carnal mind. We were literally in it and couldn't get out of it like quicksand. The more you struggle, the deeper you get. Right? But, verse 8, but now you also put them all aside. Anger. Wrath. Malice. Slander. Abusive speech. You put away all those things. Now you, ha- now you have the ability to overcome these things. Why? Because your mind's been transformed. So you are a new person. It's literally not the same person. They don't think the same way. So therefore, if they don't think the same way, they're not going to act the same way. And if they don't act the same way, it's not the same person. How many of you have ever walked up to somebody and said, man, you've changed. Some of that's good, some of it's not so good. Right? Why did we change? Why do they think we changed? Because we're doing things differently than we did before. Well, why are we doing things differently than we did before? Because we don't think the same way we used to think. But now you also put them off, all all, all these things, verse 9. 
do not lie to one another. Now we, we're, we're practicing this now. Now that our minds have been transformed, this is what we practice. We don't lie to one another. Since we laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being right it's that process it's plug and play he's snatching out a dirty nasty lego and he's putting in a clean pure lego and eventually the whole thing will be sanctified perfected and we have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge that insinuates that there's a false knowledge most people have a false knowledge about who God wants them to be um, greasy grace perfect example of that people who believe greasy grace is you can do whatever you want to do and God's grace is going to cover you your mercy you can be a sinner and still make it to heaven right do whatever you want to do They're, they have a knowledge of who they think God wants them to be but it's a false knowledge but when we submit our mind to God and it becomes transformed, then we are renewed. Our mind is renewed and we are revealed a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. True knowledge. True identity. Truth. Because we made a relationship with the one who is truth. And he's revealed that truth to us. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man. We don't, our, literally our identity changes to the place that we don't even associate ourselves by the divisions of this world anymore. A person who's still talking about race, such as, well, you know, I'm going to go to the church down the street that has a white pastor because I'm more comfortable with a white pastor. Non-transformed mind. Red flag. <laughs> it's, a, it's an inside joke from my brothers. Red, red flag. I need to go to a black church because I'm more comfortable with the music over there. Red flag. Your mind ain't changed. You're still identifying with classifications and divisions that the carnal mind places upon us. Because a transformed person doesn't even divide himself from somebody else because of these carnal classifications and divisions. He sees a black, brother, a black man as a brother just as much as he sees a white man as a brother. And if he don't, his mind's not been transformed. You literally have a new identity to the place to where you don't even, you don't even connect yourself. You don't even identify yourself with the things you once identified yourself as. True transformation. <laughs> yeah, maybe I need to. Got kind of deep there. It's red flag. Let me move on. 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, not pride, humility, gentleness. Patience. That's, the, that's what the, that describes the new Leroy. It describes the new Annie. It describes the new Valdo. The new Valdo is compassionate, kind, humble, gentle, patient. Goes for every one of us in here. That's, that identity has been hidden with Christ in God. And that's what it looks like. 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the, 
It's funny to me when he always talks about forgiveness, he always brings up how Jesus forgave us. Always. So like if you had any out whatsoever, you're like, yeah, but my situation's a little bit different. He tags this on just to make sure that you have no excuse. Just like Jesus forgave you. 14. Beyond all these things, put on love. That new self is a loving person. Because the love of God has been revealed to him through relationship. And now he knows how to act that out and mimic what he's seen God do. He mimics that to others. But beyond all these things, put on love, which is, everybody's scared to death of the perfect word. Scared to death. Slammed to death. I know people even brag about not being perfect. I see Christians all the time. Well, I'm not perfect, but I'm forgiven. Well, why would you brag on the devil? Why do you have more faith in your flesh to sin than you have faith in God to keep you from sinning? And you brag about it. I'm not perfect. I'm just forgiven. Well, being forgiven means you're supposed to be becoming perfect. Even as your Father which is in heaven. How perfect? That just means a little bit mature. How perfect? As perfect as God? All right, let's go back. For, we rewind about 30 minutes. If I asked you right now, is it possible to be as perfect as God is perfect? Carnal-minded people say, no, you're never going to be as perfect as God is perfect. Spiritually-minded people, yes. It's absolutely possible. Jesus said the same exact words in Matthew 5, 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. No way around it. And we're scared of it because we're carnal minded. Because the mind hasn't been transformed yet. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Verse 15. Let the peace of Christ, and the peace of Christ is greater than the peace the world offers. We talked about that when we were talking about sons of peace. John 16, 33. Greater, not as the world giveth. But I give unto you greater peace. Let the peace, this divine peace of God that is only accessed when you offer your mind to him to be transformed. Then he can give you the gift of perfect peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, minds, to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. 16. Let the word of Christ meditate on his word. Meditate on his commandments. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, which is what we're doing today, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do, here it is, rubber meets the road. This is the ultimate goal of God. To get control of your mind so that he can control then what you do. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name or what that really means is authority. In the authority of the Lord Jesus giving thanks through him to God the Father. Stand with me if you will please. Let's lift our hands right now, if you will. And, and just as a physical sign, but I hope that your mind is there. That's what, that's what the goal is, to offer our minds to God. Lift your hands, lift your hearts, lift your minds unto Him. And begin to tell Him, God, I want this. What, what has been presented by the apostles in your word, I want that. I want that new identity. I want to become that person that they describe in the scriptures who's loving and kind and gentle who puts away wrath and anger and malice and slander and that old life, that old me is literally buried and I am raised in a newness of life with Christ for that new life is hidden. It's hidden in you but God I'm coming after it. I hunger 
to get my mind through prayer, through meditation, through stillness, to present my mind before you. Transform my mind, oh God. I want true change. I don't want to just go through the motions of calling myself a Christian. I want to be engulfed in Christ, covered by Christ. I want to put on Christ. I want to be in Christ to the fullest meaning of what that statement is. That I be saturated by Christ. Transform my mind, Father. I give myself to you. I give myself. I give my heart. I give my mind. I give my desires, my emotions, my troubles, my worries, my anxieties, my fears. I cast all of my cares upon you right now. For you care for me. And you are waiting there with a new me. Who's not bound by these things anymore. But a new me that's been set free and delivered and empowered to be an overcomer. I want that, Father. I seek that. Not only right now, but the next few days and and weeks and the rest of my life is going to be devoted to seeking you. That I be transformed by the renewing of my mind on a daily basis. Here I am, Father. Thank you for his word this morning. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's amazing when you sitting here this, this morning. It's really simple. It's really simple. I find myself sometimes, you know, just, just raising my two sons, Tammy and I, and especially Derek now driving and I'm giving him instruction all the while I can can hear my dad's voice in my mind giving me that same instruction and I'm repeating those words to him God's doing the same thing our Heavenly Father is doing the same thing He's always speaking my dad was real calm when he corrected me he would ask me questions what did you do wrong? what do you think you did wrong? What are you going to do next time different in this same situation? So I would make, he would make sure I learned a lesson from my mistake. God's doing that all the time. If we'll just listen. He's not, he's not yelling at you. I think I've yelled more at my kids than uh, <laughs> my dad did. But he was always real calm during those situations. He had those hot button issues. You disrespect your mom or you lie to me, I'm going to tear your rear end up. But it, any other thing that I would do, he'd always be patient. He'd be soft-spoken and correcting me. And God's doing that. How many times do we listen to him during a day, downloading stuff, and we hear it, but then we don't apply it? My toes were stepped on this morning. I'm trying to be a better father, a husband, a better leader at my job, a better friend. And I'm trying to practice things and so that people can see Christ in me on a daily basis. Easier said than done. But if we'll just listen to that small, still voice, He will give us guidance. If we will trust in Him and be faithful, He will give us guidance. Praise God. If you need prayer this morning, if you're sick in the body, the Bible says for you to call on the elders, not for them to call on you. Make your way to the front for prayer. If you feel like you want to come to the altar this morning just to talk to God a little bit, maybe, maybe you need a, a, a spiritual touch, please come forward this morning and ask for the elders to pray for you. Praise God.